Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled Awful Choices, Bayer Rustin's Radical Vision and the Social Movements of the 1960s. We're joined tonight by lead scholar Gerald Podair from Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. Today is April the 14th, 2021. Kind of hard to believe that uh, the academic year is rolling to a, a conclusion soon after such uh, many months of disruptions. Feels like I've been with a lot of you in the same room uh, a lot this uh, year, including just last night. I do appreciate you coming back. My name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs on behalf of Libby and Mike, as well as our uh, graduate interns, Hannah and Carly and Josh. I want to thank you for spending another evening with us for another episode of the webinar series. In particular, I want to note that, uh, you know, we've got folks from scattered from different places across the country, certainly coming from different grade levels. It's always nice to see new faces, folks like Morgan, who's joining us tonight from uh, Milwaukee. Um, also, Meredith, just down the street from me in Durham, North Carolina. And, you know, listen, it's, it's never a webinar without a lot of Los Angeles teachers with us. Dominique, Jeanette, Sanjita, I really appreciate you being here tonight. I also want to note that this is the third webinar of three that we uh, especially co-produced with the Nas National Council for the Social Studies. Uh, many of you may recall attending earlier sessions this year, one with uh, Mia Fuller on the uh, role and uh, how to understand and interpret monuments in both world and US history. And also Keneal Parker, who joined us last fall to share his work as a past NHC fellow um, in immigration and immigration and legal policies. I'm really pleased that we can, uh, we can put together this packet of webinars on an annual basis with NCSS. I was very fortunate to be on the board of directors for uh, the council for three years, uh, concluding in 2019. And I know that uh, as, a, as a board, as an organization, as a state council, as many of you likely belong to, they really care about preparing you and giving you the resources and support to go into your classroom every day and be a more effective uh, social studies and humanities educators. So I do want to encourage you to take a look at the NCSS website. I'd also like to welcome, uh, just for a, a brief couple of remarks, Larry Pasca, who's the executive director of NCSS, and we'll share more about this uh, project. Hey, Larry, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Andy. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much for having us uh, and, and NCSS as a partner again in, in this work. So good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be with you tonight on this special program. I'm Larry Pasca, the Executive Director of NCSS. This program is made through a special partnership that we have with the Library of Congress and the Teaching with Primary Sources, uh, or TPS, consortium. Now, NCSS is a, is a proud T TPS member. Um, we received a grant last year, and part of our funding is to develop two online methods texts for social studies educators. So these are for pre-service educators, for methods professors working in our schools of education. And the methods texts are meant to focus on how you teach with primary sources and how you teach inquiry in the social studies. And it is, again, designed to help our teacher candidates and, and early career teachers uh, really hone in their craft on inquiry and primary source engagement. And so at NCSS, we're proud of being a member of that coalition and that partnership. Um, and we also wanted to share with you that we revised our vision statement a few years ago. And so we do focus very strongly at NCSS on lifelong inquiry and informed civic action. We hope that you'll join us in this vision. And part of the work that you are going to be experiencing tonight is really grounded in our C3 framework. And so if you're not familiar with our C3 framework, um, the inquiry arc for the framework um, focuses on developing and answering compelling questions about the world around us, focusing on applying disciplinary tools and concepts and disciplines like history, uh, geography, economics, civics, and others, uh, using multiple sources of evidence to draw conclusions, and lastly, to communicate those conclusions and take informed action. So I invite you to learn more about us at NCSS. Our C3 framework is at socialstudies.org forward slash C3. Um, learn more about membership if you're interested in learning more about um, joining our community of social studies learners. And you can always follow us on social media or email us anytime for more information. Um, we do run professional learning programs um, all year round, and especially with partners like the National Humanities Center. And again, a special thank you to the National Humanities Center for inviting us into this, um, just this outstanding series. We look forward to partnering with you again next year on more programming. Thank you.
Thank you, Larry. And before you run off, I'm going to uh, ask you, if you would, just speak to speak for a moment about the annual conference. Wow, Larry, this is a great opportunity to share that fantastic what we hope to be physical event next fall. Absolutely. So we actually are having two special events next year, or this year rather, sorry. Our 101st annual conference will be in Minneapolis on uh, November 19th through 21st. And we have a special 100th anniversary conference. So NCSS is starting a second century of service for educators. So we're celebrating with a special 100th anniversary conference in Washington, D.C., December 10th to 12th. You actually can visit us again at socialstudies.org forward slash conference for more information and updates. We are keeping, obviously, you know, mindful of health and safety precautions in our host cities and looking to bring you a very safe experience. Um, but we are excited to provide not one but two professional learning programs for you at the end of the year. Again, celebrating social studies, but also looking forward to inquiry, informed action, and really what the future of our entire discipline um, is going to look like. So I hope you join us for one or both events later this year. Fantastic, Larry. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, thanks again for all the good work you do at the National uh, Council for, for the Social Studies. The National Humanities Center is located in Durham, North Carolina, not too far from, uh, from Meredith, as a matter of fact. And we too are concluding our academic year. Each year we welcome an annual fellowship class of uh, scholars and academics who have a, a project idea. I sometimes refer to the center as a laboratory and uh, I ask you to consider it as a place where the humanities are constructed or interpreted or created or um, or somehow documented. And in some ways, I think what Larry just shared and what we'll talk about tonight is really the key to that kind of approach, whether you're a scholar at the university level or a world-class history educator in one of your schools. And that is to say, using the evidence, the tools, the artifacts, the uh, the details of, of, uh, of the past to try to recreate it, reanimate it, and make it uh, relevant for your students is, is really uh, your ultimate goal. And we're very pleased at the center to support not only that happening in the scholarly level, but also in the instructional level. You'll find all of this scholarship and this instruction in our Humanities Across Digital Library. Uh, each of you walked through the front door in order to sign up for tonight's webinar, and I appreciate you doing so. I hope you do take some time to peruse the shelves, to use the search function, and also to consider ways that you can construct curriculum using this open education resource platform. This is a free and open platform. It's agnostic in terms of grade level and content, so you can create and differentiate really any way that you see fit. Uh, that does include, by the way, uh, accessing the resources for each of the webinars that we've hosted. Tonight's session, for example, you can go and find the pre-readings, and these pre-readings as selected by uh, Professor Podair will give you a chance to learn a little bit more about the topic and then consider ways that you can create instruction based on that. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, many different partners also contributing resources. A little over 80 at this point have made their resources free and available through this platform. And again, our hope is that you can use them to create curriculum and then publish it back in the library under your own name with direct citation. Kind of hard to believe that the webinar series is reaching uh, the final innings. We only have four left, four left before this year's uh, webinar series has concluded. Uh, we generally run from early September to late April, early May, and I'm really pleased to welcome these four scholars to uh, to run through the, the last of the batting lineup uh, for us uh, in the next month or so. If you haven't signed up and you're interested in not only the topics, but earning the five hours of professional development credit, I encourage you to go and sign up. Please also share this with your faculty or others that you think might be of interest. Or if you are at that end of the year, as many educators uh, find themselves and need some more professional development credit hours, and you really wanna use it to explore topics that are of particular interest and relevance for you, I'd encourage you to take a look at our online courses. These courses are five weeks in length. they are about five hours of work per week, which is about the same as attending a webinar, and they earn 35 hours of professional development credit. All of our work has been endorsed at most of the states around the country, including Los Angeles Unified, which sometimes thinks it's a state in and of itself. The last thing I wanna remind you to do is if you're interested um, to uh, apply to join our Teacher Advisory Council, we're very fortunate to have worked with uh, 20 wonderful educators this year, and we're looking forward to welcoming another cohort next year. The application process runs through May the 3rd, and we do encourage you to consider completing an application.
Uh, Robert, this is directly to you, but also to anyone else who is joining us for the first time. Our Power uh, Webinars, as you know, is are based in audio and PowerPoint only. Consider this a radio program, and this is uh, one of our episodes. So you can manipulate the volume just underneath the photograph of the speaker. You can also use the two tabs to communicate with us. One, the audience chat allows you to chat back and forth with your neighbors and colleagues. The Ask Professor Podar tab, though, allows you to submit more formal questions. As the moderator, I'll review them and bring them to, uh, to Jerry's attention when the time seems right. If for some reason you get lost, your Wi-Fi is disrupted, you can't quite hear, don't fear. Uh, your best solution, I'm afraid to say, is to refresh your page or log out and come back in. It should not disrupt your, um, the documentation of you being with us. So again, you have joined the Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled Awful Choices, Bayer Rustin's Radical Vision and the Social Movements of the 1960s. I'm extremely pleased to be joined by Gerald Podair, Professor of History and Robert S. French, Professor of American Studies at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. Hey, Jerry, can you hear me up there in the upper Midwest? Hello, Jerry. Thanks, Joanne. I'm glad that that worked out for you. Jerry, can you hear me? If so, don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay, can, can you hear me now? <laughs> now we can hear you. You gave us all just a little bit of a start, but the good news is all of these teachers have been through this a million times and they were patient and gracious with us. Okay, great. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you for joining us again and leading tonight's conversation. Um, you know, as we begin this, this discussion, and, and again, this is gonna be a chance for us to ask questions and to learn more about your expertise and your uh, just, just foundational work on, on Bayard Rustin. Um, I'm wondering if you can start by answering just a quick framing question for me, and, and maybe, maybe we'll revisit this as the night goes forward. Um, you may have noticed in my introductory slide, I asked our teachers, our attendees, to note some of the uh, figures or individuals that they often teach or refer to as they discuss social movements of the 1960s. And, you know, as I, as I constructed that question, it occurred to me that, you know, when we pluralize social movements, in some ways we're implying equivalence, uh, social, that, that there's this big body of social movements all kind of, you know, lumped together. Answer me this, are, are all social movements equal in importance and relevance and co in context or, or is it about the context? How do we differentiate that? Well, that really goes to the, uh, to the issue of what it is to be a, a historian and uh, what, what does it mean to study history? Because to study history, you have to make uh, differential judgments uh, about facts, uh, about historical characters. Uh, I always tell my students that uh, uh, all, all facts are important, but some are more important than others. Uh, and so we do have to make value judgments. I mean, in, in, in my teaching, uh, I'll have to admit that I, I prioritize the civil rights struggle and the civil rights movement when I teach about the 1960s, because the other movements, the women's movement, the uh, gay rights movement, the uh, American Indian movement, the Latinx movement, uh, basically takes its cues from the civil rights movement. Uh, and so in that sense, yes, some social movements uh, have more significance or more importance uh, than others. They're all important, just some are more important than others. And you do sometimes look for foundational movements, mm -hmm. foundational moments, foundational historical subjects, individuals, uh, uh, we do that when we study history generally, and uh, certainly in the 1960s, uh, you really have to start with the civil rights movement. Yeah, I really love the way that you frame that and, and you know, answer that question very directly, which I appreciate. And it does seem, you know, every single teacher, regardless of level, is always making value judgments in their curriculum and what they teach, because you can't teach everything. And so... They have to choose uh, what's important. And I, I think one of the reasons tonight's session was so uh, interesting for me and one of the reasons we scheduled it with you is that in some ways, maybe this is a choice that we're gonna argue is an important one to make. This, this is a good place to start, even if you don't teach Rustin uh, 
as often or as much as you as you probably do. Right, right. You know, again, I'm always telling my students, and I would tell this to anyone who who teaches history, start with a smaller story and tell a larger one through it. And what attracted me to Bayard Rustin in the first place was that uh, you could tell a larger story of the civil rights movement, of America in the second half of the 20th century through his life. Uh, and that's, I think, what you look for uh, uh, as a historian when you're looking for things to study, when you're looking for people to study. That's, that's really fantastic. And it also pulls us away from the sort of iconic nature of uh, some larger than life personalities. And, you know, in my view, probably gives students some, uh, you know, some, some figures they may not be as familiar with may actually give them a uh, deeper purchase. Thank, thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to the way that you unpack this for us. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Uh, and uh, let me just start by uh, by talking a bit about about Bayard Rustin. And I think you'll see uh, uh, as as I speak why he is so fascinating. Uh, you know, another thing I always tell my students, uh, and this is obviously not to cast any aspersions on Martin Luther King. I tell my students, don't let Martin Luther King crowd out many, many other important civil rights figures. We have a tendency to allow that to happen because King is so monumental and so consequential. Uh, you know, if you were to make a list of the most important Americans in the 20th century, he would either be number one or certainly in the top two or three. But as important as he is, there are so many other major figures in the civil rights movement uh, who need to be studied, who should be studied, and Bayard Rustin was, was certainly one of them. So Bayard Rustin's life, uh, uh, and he lived between 1912 and 1987, uh, was both an American triumph and an American tragedy, uh, an illustration of both America's possibilities and its limitations, and both the possibilities and limitations of American radicalism in the 20th century. Now, few, if any, radical visions have been as broad and all-inclusive and capacious as Bayard Rustin. Uh, he was, I believe, uh, America's first intersectional radical. Uh, long before this term was coined to denote the use of multiple and intersecting forms of identity as an organizational principle for social justice activism. Uh, Rustin, to my mind, was an intersectionalist, even though he had never heard of the word. He died in 1987. Consider Bayard Rustin's multiple identities. He was at once a black man, a gay man, a worker, a pacifist, and a democratic socialist, and an activist for civil rights, for labor rights, for socialism, for pacifism, and for gay rights. Bayard Rustin spent his life trying to com combine all of these into a coherent program for radical, political, social, and economic change in the United States. Although I should note that Rustin was a gay rights activist only during the last 10 years of his life, from the late 1970s until his death in uh, 1987. When Walt Whitman famously wrote in his Song of Myself, do I contradict myself? Very well then. I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Whitman could have been writing about Bayard Rustin one century later. Rustin's radicalism indeed contained multitudes. His radical American vision was one in which all Americans would have a job, would have an adequate income, would have access to adequate medical care, would be adequately housed and educated, and in which the national government, the state, and 
when we talk about the state, we don't necessarily mean a state in the union, like my native Wisconsin, but the government apparatus in which the government apparatus, the state in Rustin's mind, would be responsible for all the services I just mentioned and where these rights would be enshrined constitutionally as national rights of citizenship, job, income, health care, and in which the national government would be responsible for planning and managing the economy in a fair and equitable manner, owning or closely regulating the means of industrial production in a system where workers through their unions would play a major role in running them in a democratic manner that was a hallmark of this democratic socialist state that Rustin envisioned, a state that was committed to racial equality and to ensuring not only that no American would be disadvantaged by their race, but in which every American would have the opportunity to rise to the level of their own individual abilities and be judged only on those abilities and achievements, to be judged on what they did, not who they were, and a state and national government that was committed in addition to the principles of peace and nonviolence, working closely with international organizations to reduce the proliferation of weapons of destruction and to arbitrate conflicts short of the mechanisms of war. And finally, and as I just mentioned, this was only in the last 10 years of his life, an America that was a sexual democracy that protected the rights of all to express themselves sexually as they wish and ensured that love itself was no longer a crime, depending on the identity of the lovers, as it had been when Rustin himself was arrested and convicted for what at the time was known as a lewd act in 1953. So this was Bayard Rustin's radical dream for America, and it indeed contained multitudes. This was its great strength, but also its weakness, and ultimately its undoing. Because the elements of Bayard Rustin's American radical vision crashed against each other throughout his life, for forcing him to choose between them, often in the cruelest and most heartbreaking way. And these awful choices, which I'll be talking about in more detail later, ultimately destroyed his radical vision, one that was so unique in the United States of the 20th century because it was so coherent, it was so programmatic, it was so holistic. The parts of Bayard Rustin's vision fit together in ways that other more limited and parochial radical visions did not. For example, Rustin insisted on placing class identity at the center of his intersectionality. He recognized it as equivalent to the racial, gender, and sexual identities that appear to lie at the heart of contemporary intersectional approaches, which certainly acknowledge class, but concentrate more on the cultural markers of identity as means of interpretation and engines of change. But for Rustin, a class identity, a working class identity, a unionist identity was more than a talking point. It was essential to his radical vision as essential as any identity he might have had as a black man or as a gay man. But as we will see, Rustin's working class identity 
was not always compatible with his racial identity. They clashed in elemental ways during the Ocean Hill-Brownsville schools crisis of 1968, about which I've written a book. And after spending his career affirming the essential harmony of those identities, they reinforced each other, he always maintained. Rustin was forced to choose between them, as if he were a character in a Greek tragedy, damned no matter which way he turned. These awful choices not only ruined Rustin's standing in the African-American community and the civil rights movement, causing him to spend the last two decades of his life marginalized from them, but they also destroyed the chances for his broad-based intersectional radical agenda in the United States by breaking it into its component parts increasingly at war with each other and raising the question of whether intersectionality itself offers the chance for a transformational American radicalism in the 20th century, especially when class identity is added to the mix of racial, gender, and sexual identities that make up intersectionality today. In Rustin's intersectional vision, or his version of intersectionality, white working class identities were an integral part of his interracial coalition for economic and political change. But many contemporary intersectionalists, often viewing working class whites as oppressors, sometimes as deplorables, often define them out of the intersectional matrix, out of the coalition of the oppressed that Rustin envisioned, leaving them to the GOP, to Donald Trump, or to worse. And leaving us to wonder if intersectionality in the 21st century will devolve into a collection of squabbling racial, gendered, and sexual interest groups, each demanding theirs and theirs alone. Not justice, but just us. And thus, Bayard Rustin's intersectional life is important, not just on its own terms, not just as a window onto the triumphs and failures of 20th century American radicalism, but also to American radicalism's fate in the 21st century and whether it can hold together to offer a programmatic remedy to the American people for the ills of racism, war, sexism, homophobia, income equality, and poverty, as Bayard Rustin dreams, or instead to present merely a fractured and ultimately exclusionary array of special pleadings and causes. So let us first explore that life, Bayard Rustin's life what he dreamed of and tried to build, and then explore the awful choices that he faced as the components of his radical program clashed and conflicted and contradicted, marking the limits of even the most capacious and transformative American vision. Bayard Rustin was born in 1912 in Westchester, Pennsylvania, to a teenage mother and a virtually unknown, at least to him, father. His grandmother, who was a Quaker, raised him to be a pacifist. Byard's grandparents were also involved in civil rights and knew and hosted W.E.B. Du Bois in their home. After attending, but not graduating from two colleges, Rustin moved to New York City in 1937 and immersed himself in radical politics and social movements. Rustin 
uh, joined the Young Communist League uh, in 1940. By then, he had a he had developed a radicalism that used his pacifism and nonviolence as a means to social change. His idea of nonviolent direct action came out of his pacifism, the idea of breaking an unjust law or defying an unjust social practice nonviolently and inviting and accepting the retaliatory punishment that went with it as a public declaration of its unjust, unjustness and need to change. Then the idea would be to enlist men and women of goodwill as witnesses to this disobedience and as allies in eradicating the injustice. So Rustin was already fusing peace, Marxism, and civil rights. He began to work with the black labor leader, A. Philip Randolph, who was the founder of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and a leading socialist on civil rights causes. A. Philip Randolph, who was a leading, uh, a, a, a leading uh, civil rights labor leader in the early 1940s, probably the most famous in the United States, uh, employed Rustin as his, as his assistant as Randolph planned the March on Washington in 1941, not the March on Washington that we've all heard of in 1963, an earlier March on Washington. Uh, this one would be a protest against discrimination in the defense industry and would be the first mass demonstration of African Americans in Washington, D.C. in the nation's history. That's sometimes something that we forget uh, uh, there was no tradition of mass African-American protest in Washington, D.C. until well into the 20th century. Now, after having planned the march, Randolph ended up calling it off over Rustin's opposition after Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, issued an executive order banning discrimination in the defense industry and setting up a Fair Employment Practice Committee. But after Nazi Germany invaded the USSR in June 1941, the American Communist Party, which Rustin was working with, instructed its members to cease all civil rights activities so as not to disrupt what would, in a few months, become the American war effort and which would be essential to the survival of the Soviet Union. Bayard Rustin left the Communist Party over this issue and became a lifelong socialist and anti-communist. For the rest of Rustin's life, he viewed communists as cynical and dishonest. Rustin then joined the staff of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a pacifist social justice group, and in 1942, helped organize and work for the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, the Fellowship of Reconciliation's Civil Rights Arm. Now, the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, was built around nonviolent direct action, peacefully demonstrating for civil rights. Now, in late 1943, Rustin was drafted. He refused even conscientious objector status, uh, stating his total opposition to war, uh, even one such as this one, World War II, which was ostensibly for human justice. And Rustin was sentenced, sentenced to three years in federal prison in February 1944. Now, while in prison, Rustin engaged in acts of civil disobedience, attempting to integrate Southern penitentiaries, 
that's where he was he was being held mostly in the south Rustin was in fact not released until almost a year after World War II ended in June 1946 in 1947 Rustin participated in the Congress on Racial Equality's Journey of Reconciliation, an attempt to integrate interstate buses in the South, during which Rustin and his fellow demonstrators were arrested multiple times and attacked by a white mob uh, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, of all places. Rustin later served 22 days on a North Carolina chain gang for violating a local segregationist ordinance. In 1948, Rustin worked again with a Philip Randolph, this time to desegregate the United States Armed Forces, counseling black servicemen to engage in acts of civil disobedience and direct action. When Randolph succeeded in his campaign to have President Harry Truman issue an executive order integrating the military, he called off the campaign. But this was not enough for Rustin, whose commitment to pacifism superseded even his commitment to civil rights, at least at the time. Rustin attempted to continue the campaign on his own, and even released a press release purportedly under Randolph's name, criticizing Truman's dis desegregation order. This, not surprisingly, caused a major break between the two men that lasted for two years. The next year, 1949, Rustin traveled to India, where he studied the tenets and philosophy of Gandhian nonviolent political and social change with Gandhi's successor, Jawaharlal Nehru, and returned to the United States, determined to employ its principles in the struggle for civil rights. But before he could do so, Rustin ran afoul of the nation's homophobic impulses. He was arrested in Pasadena, California in January 1953 for engaging in sex in a parked car with two males and sentenced to 60 days in jail for what at the time was termed a lewd act. Rustin was immediately fired by the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which despite its progressive stances on racial and peace-related issues, was unforgiving with regard to homosexuality. After a fallow period of unemployment and part-time manual labor, uh, Rustin spent time as a furniture mover, his career was resurrected when he was hired as the executive secretary of the War Resisters League, which was a non-sectarian pacifist organization. The Fellowship of Reconciliation was church-affiliated, which partially explains its decision to terminate Rustin when his homosexuality became a public issue. The War Resisters League would be Rustin's home for the next decade, with the added advantage of it being willing to lend his time and services out through leaves of absences so that he could work on the other aspects of his radical program, socialism, labor rights, and increasingly civil rights. And in 1956, at the start of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Montgomery bus boycott, Rustin traveled to Montgomery to assist the young minister as well as to counsel him on the application of the principles of nonviolent direct action, which Dr. King had learned during his recent time in seminary studies, but that Rustin had been practicing in real life for decades. Now, believe it or not, there were guns in Dr. Martin Luther King's house when Rustin first visited him in Montgomery in February 1956, and with good reason, given the death threats against King in the wake of the Montgomery bus boycott, which was hurting the white community there. But with Rustin's counsel, 
King was able to use nonviolent direct action and its philosophy not just to emerge victorious in the Montgomery boycott, but to make nonviolent direct action the linchpin of the civil rights movement generally in the United States. And Rustin was intimately involved in that application of nonviolent direct action to America's racial struggles, including Rustin's work to help found the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1957. While King was the nominal head of the organization, and of course its public face and voice, Bayard Rustin was actually its planner and strategist, and probably would have eventually become its actual president, except in 1960, the New York congressman and political power broker Adam Clayton Powell Jr., jealous of Rustin's emerging influence with King, threatened to out Rustin and even to imply the existence of an affair between King and Rustin, unless Rustin was jettisoned. Now, King, who in his defense had enough problems in his life as a civil rights leader, accusations of communist ties, jailings, threats against his life, the seeming impenetrability of the Jim Crow apparatus in the South, enough problems to add to these the issue of homosexual ties, uh, and who led an organization of culturally conservative ministers, King decided he had no choice but to cut Rustin loose, which he did, but only temporarily. Because in 1963, King would call upon Rustin to organize the March on Washington, the most important civil rights march in history, and arguably the most important single event in the history of the modern civil rights movement. Now, Rustin's career as an activist culminated on the day of the March on Washington, August 28, 1963, in which two components of Rustin's activist agenda, civil rights and economic justice, combined in what was known as the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. With support for President Kennedy's then pending civil rights bill, uh, providing for political freedom paired with social democratic demands for guaranteed jobs, income, health services, and educational opportunities. Bayard Rustin was the genius behind the March on Washington, and except for King himself, who Rustin insisted speak last on the program, certainly an example of Rustin's promotional genius. Rustin was the reason it was as successful as it was. From years of organizing demonstrations and protests, Rustin was the master of logistics. He knew how to move masses of people, and there were 250,000 people on the mall that day, in and out of venues quickly and efficiently. Rustin knew how to feed people. He knew, for example, that there should be no mayonnaise on the sandwiches distributed to the marchers since it was going to be hot in Washington in August. Rustin knew how to ensure that there would be order. He deputized African-American policemen as marshals to make sure that there would be no violence to detract from their nonviolent message. And if you look at film, that video of the march, you see these marshals because they're wearing, they're wearing special hats. You could see them even uh, on, the, on the podium as Martin Luther King speaks. Rustin even knew how to clean up after the march was over. Less than an hour after King finished speaking, there was not one piece of litter, not even a straight paper cup on the mall. Even knew how many portable bathrooms <laughs> would be needed to service a crowd of that size. He really did know everything about logistics. Now, after King gave his famous speech that day, 
Rustin was brought forward and given a standing ovation by the huge crowd as he raised his arms in triumph. In the shadows for so long, a draft resistor, a so-called moral defender, he was now in the bright sunlight. Rustin was even on the cover of Life magazine the week after the march. But as bright as the future may have looked from the perspective of King's I Have a Dream speech and the success of the March on Washington, the rest of the 1960s would be less kind to Rustin's intersectional dream as its components collided and his awful choices between and among them pressed in. Rustin was now an insider. President Johnson conferred with him on civil rights legislation and on the war on poverty. Rustin even stood behind Johnson in the Oval Office in August 1965 as the president signed the Voting Rights Act that Rustin had helped pass. During the Democratic National Convention in 1964, Rustin had represented the Johnson administration as an emissary to the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was challenging the segregated white Mississippi delegation's credentials at the convention, advocating, in vain as it turns out, that the Freedom Democrats accept a compromise whereby the white delegation would be seated for the 1964 convention but that going forward, all delegations would be selected without discriminatory practices. The Mississippi Freedom Activists and their allies in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, SNCC, led at the time by John Lewis, denounced Rustin as a sellout. While Rustin defended himself as engaging in practical politics, the only kind of politics Rustin now believed that would lead to his vision of a political uh, and economic e equality, uh, not only for black Americans, but for all Americans. The next year, 1965, Rustin explained his new pragmatic philosophy in a celebrated article entitled From Protest to Politics, which he published in Commentary Magazine. Now, in it, Rustin argued that the protest phase of the civil rights movement was over with the passage of laws and the opening up of the Democratic Party for African Americans, with the concomitant movement of Southern whites to the Republican Party, which was by then, 1965, underway. The new phase of the civil rights movement going forward would now involve not demonstrations, but practical politics, as African Americans built coalitions with white liberals, uh, religious groups, and especially labor unions, which Rustin viewed as the bedrock constituency for economic justice in America. Rustin viewed blacks as a major constituency of the Democratic Party, which, as the party of the federal government, would at last redeem the promise of equal protection of laws that the 14th Amendment had embodied a century before, but whose promise had only recently begun to be fulfilled. The future would involve not marches, but elections, and not the streets, but legislative halls and committee rooms, with a working class coalition of blacks and whites with working within the Democratic Party for systemic political and economic change. By 1965 then, Rustin had traveled a long way from the outsider demonstrating for peace and racial equality and socialism to the insider negotiating with the very power structure he had spent so much of his life confronting. But Rustin's new stance did not mean that the cruel choices between elements of his radical program, his intersectional program, ones that he had already confronted on numerous occasions, and I'll discuss them a bit later, it didn't mean that they had disappeared. If anything, in fact, they had become more compelling and more cruel 
1966, Rustin unveiled the Freedom Budget, a program that aimed to radically expand on the existing war on poverty by committing $185 billion over the next 10 years to eradicate poverty completely in the United States with a guaranteed job, doctor, and residence for every American. The Freedom Budget was the culmination of Rustin's democratic dream. It would offer a standard of living that would exceed the official poverty line in the United States, and thus, by definition, it would end poverty in the United States. Rustin furthermore argued that the Freedom Budget could be paid for from economic growth, which he assumed would continue unabated and would thus not require raised taxes or even a reduction in the national defense budget. But, of course, when Rustin made this assertion in 1966, the Vietnam War was raging, as was anti-war sentiment on the left, among many of those with whom Rustin had made common cause in his earlier years of peace advocacy, as well as among the young and the student population, heavily influenced by what was known as the New Left. And Rustin, as an old-line socialist, was very much old left. The New Left, which took aim at American imperialism and colonialism abroad and racism at home. Certainly, as anchored outside traditional political and economic systems as Rustin was now anchored within them. Anti-Vietnam War activists viewed Rustin's argument that the freedom budget would not require cuts in defense as an endorsement of the Vietnam War. And it is true that out of loyalty to President Johnson, the man who had passed the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act and was conducting a war on poverty, which may not have been all that Rustin wanted, but at least was a start, Rustin was muting his criticism of the war. As far as the anti-war movement was concerned, Rustin was now a turncoat, a sellout, just as he had appeared to the activists of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee two years earlier in 1964. Rustin's Freedom Budget campaign foundered under the weight of anti-war movement and new left opposition, as well as the Johnson administration's unwillingness to commit more funds to the struggle against poverty in the United States than it already had done. Rustin had hoped to graft a democratic socialist agenda onto the already existing Democratic Party structure. But that party, at least under Johnson, was a liberal party and not a socialist one. And Rustin was discovering the limits of coalition politics in bringing about the kind of systemic change he sought when his coalition partners were much more cautious than he was. And then in 1968, Rustin became embroiled in the racially incendiary Ocean Hill-Brownsville school crisis in New York the single most divisive racial moment in New York City's 20th century history, and one which I spent over a decade of my life with as I wrote first my doctoral dissertation and then a book on it, as two more of Rustin dreams collided. Now, the Ocean Hill-Brownsville dispute allow, uh, involved an attempt uh, of a local school board in the predominantly black and Puerto Rican Ocean Hill-Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn to terminate a group of white teachers belonging to the United Federation of Teachers Union, or the UFT, a union with very close ties to Rustin, and which had been a strong supporter of the civil rights movement, from the March on Washington to the Selma voting rights campaign in 1965, and even as the Ocean Hill-Brownsville dispute unfolded in May 1968, the union was a supporter of Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign, which had begun on the Mall in Washington after his assassination a month earlier in April 1968 under the leadership uh, of 
King's successor, Ralph Abernathy, as well as the young Jesse Jackson. The Ocean Hill Brownsville teachers, who were all white, uh, had been terminated without hearings by the local school board in contravention of the United Federation of Teachers contract, as well as Central Board of Education procedures. And after the Ocean Hill Brownsville local board defied an arbitrator's order to rehire the teachers, the United Federation of Teachers struck all of New York public schools in September 1968, the first in a series of three strikes that paralyzed the city's educational system until mid-November. The strikes pitted the black community of New York, which supported the Ocean Hill Brownsville local board and the community control of schools experiment under which the board derived its power against the predominantly white United Federation of Teachers, which demanded the reinstatement of the teachers under the authority of the Central Board of Education. The strikes split the city down the middle with Manhattan-based white elites supporting the black community and middle-class whites, especially in the outer boroughs of New York City, Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, Staten Island, lining up with the United Federation of Teachers. Most of New York's white labor community also supported the teachers as a matter of union and class solidarity. Rustin, as a supporter of both civil rights and labor rights, was caught in the middle. Now, this was an all-or-nothing dispute, one of the relatively rare, true, zero-sum conundrums that history offers, forcing Rustin to an elemental choice. Wrenchingly, Rustin chose the United Federation of Teachers over the black community and class identity over racial identity. Rustin appeared with union leaders at rallies. He published editorials and open letters in support of the United Federation of Teachers and denounced the Ocean Hill Brownsville local board as the enemies of workers, the destroyers of unions, and essentially as traitors to their class, the working class. Their true place, Rustin argued, was with the teachers, who he viewed as workers and not with the professional, business, media, and academic elites of Manhattan and their political handmaidens, like upper crust mayor John Lindsay, who was a strong supporter of the local board and the community control experiment. But most African Americans in the city, including most African American union officials, did not see it Rustin's way. And when the Ocean Hill Brownsville strikes ended, with the forced return of the disputed teachers and an ostensible victory for the United Federation of Teachers and for Rustin, they denounced him as a race traitor. Rustin's reputation in the black community never recovered from his choice of class over race at Ocean Hill Brownsville. And he spent the last two decades of his life increasingly ensconced in the labor movement, which continued to honor him but also increasingly isolated from the civil rights community to which he had contributed so much. Rustin's last years were also spent in the service of gay rights, and he was instrumental in the passing of the Homosexual Rights Act in New York in 1986, a year before his death at the age of 75. But Rustin's lifelong effort to fuse class with race in America and to make that fusion the linchpin of an intersectional radicalism in America had not succeeded. It had not come to naught. His achievements in both arenas were real and substantial. But Rustin's ambitious reach had indeed exceeded his grasp. Throughout his long life, the components of Rustin's American radical dream, pacifism, socialism, gay rights, and especially civil rights and labor rights, never align consistently enough to constitute a united pragmatic force. That Rustin's dream was pragmatic and programmatic cannot be denied. And this, in my view, puts him head and shoulders above most American radicals, whose visions were much more circumscribed and shallow, not to mention parochial. But Rustin's life remains a warning to those who believe in the power of 
of identity politics alone, or even intersectional identity politics, to serve as the engine of long-term and transformational change in the United States. Rustin was almost unique, in my view, in his ability to rise above pure identity politics, including his own identities, and organize a true coalition of what he would often refer to as people in trouble, whoever they were, even if they weren't like him. Rustin was a true humanist, one of the very few that we encounter in history. But most people, and even most radicals, are not like him. When most people talk of justice, what they often mean is just us. And in the realm of identity politics, when identities clash, as they invariably do, even among self-described intersectionalists, most people go home. They go home to their own particular identities and defend them. And those who, like Rustin, attempt to hold to a unified vision are often forced to make cruel choices as well, even if they do not wish to. Consider the choices that Rustin had to make during his long intersectional career. In 1942, he was forced to choose between Marxism in the form of the Communist Party and the causes of racial justice and peace, when the party, wishing to aid the Soviet Union in its war against the Nazis, forbade all members from engaging in civil rights and pacifist activities. Rustin chose civil rights and peace and left communism behind, the beginning of a bitter argument with communist ideology and practice that lasted for the rest of his life. In 1944, Rustin was forced to choose between the cause of civil rights, World War II, after all, was at least professedly one against racism and intolerance, and that of peace when he received his draft notice. Rustin chose peace and turned his back on a struggle for human dignity and freedom in order to serve the better part of three years in a federal penitentiary. Had the war ended another way, how would Rustin be regarded today? How would he have regarded himself? While he was in prison, Rustin was forced to choose pacifism over his sexuality when he obeyed orders from the Fellowship of Reconciliation at that time and also in the decade to follow until his arrest in Pasadena in 1953 to subsume his homosexuality to what his superiors at the Fellowship of Reconciliation considered the more overriding issues of peace and war. In 1948, Rustin was forced to choose between civil rights as he joined A. Philip Randolph in attempting to desegregate the American military and pacifism as he pondered his direction in the wake of the success of that campaign through President Truman's desegregation order. Rustin chose pacifism as he chose to consider, to continue his battle against even an integrated military, cutting himself off at least for a few years from Randolph, his mentor and patron, not to mention the civil rights movement itself, to which a desegregated military was a profound symbol of progress and empowerment for black Americans during these early Cold War years. In 1964, Rustin was forced to choose between racial justice in the form of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party's challenge to the all-white state delegation at the Democratic National Convention and party politics, Lyndon Johnson's promise of civil rights legislation and a war on poverty if only Johnson could be nominated and election, elected without disruption, with conservative Republican Barry Goldwater waiting in the wings. Here, Rustin chose party politics, pragmatism over principle, an insider status with all its compromises and half measures over proud, morally unblemished outsider status with its purity of principled action. And Rustin's choice came at the cost of his estrangement from the cutting edge of the civil rights movement, at least the beginnings of that estrangement as the activists of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, of the group he helped found, the 
Congress of Racial Equality. And even Martin Luther King Jr. began to regard Rustin as one who would sell out his principles for access to power and influence. In 1966, Rustin was forced to choose between peace in the form of the anti-Vietnam War movement and socialism when he proposed a freedom budget that would guarantee every American an income, job, and health care, while at the same time taking pains to assure skeptics, especially those in the Democratic Party with whom he was now allied, notably Lyndon Johnson, that it would not require a reduction in the nation's defense budget. Clearly, Rustin signaled to powerful supporters of the war in the Democratic Party. Rustin, of course, had affirmed his pacifism many times over, notably with almost three years in prison during World War II, but here he chose socialism, unwilling to wait until the end of the war in Vietnam or elsewhere for his dream of economic justice for all Americans to come true. And this came at the cost of Rustin's standing among pacifists, the anti-war movement, and the young activists of the new left, forfeiting a constituency that he would need in the future to realize his radical vision. And finally, and most heartbreakingly, in 1968 at Ocean Hill Brownsville, Rustin was forced to choose between the cause of civil rights and the black community. After not one, but two March on Washington movements, after the journey of reconciliation, after the desegregation of the military, after the Montgomery bus boycott, after the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, after the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, after the I Have a Dream speech itself, forced between, to choose between that and those and the cause of labor and working class solidarity and the right of union members not to have their jobs taken away without hearing and due process, no matter their race which for, reason, for Rustin was the reason unions existed. And this last choice, the most awful choice of all, Rustin chose the cause of labor and the cause of class and not race because labor was the essential building block in the economically and even racially just society Rustin hoped to build. So Rustin could not turn his back on the teachers and on labor and class. And his choice cost him his standing in the black community in New York and elsewhere, and in the civil rights movement itself as it moved into the 1970s and 1980s, as Rustin became increasingly a prophet without honor in his own house. It was the highest price of all. History has been much kinder to Bayard Rustin than were his contemporaries especially African-Americans during the last 20 years of his life. He has been the subject of multiple biographies, including mine, a documentary film, a number of school namings, and in 2013, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And Rustin is now honored as among the most important and respected radical voices in 20th century American history. But the awful choices of Bayard Rustin's life, as the parts of his intersectional radicalism crash together, civil rights, labor rights, socialism, pacifism, even gay rights, testify to its elusiveness and offer a caution to those who believe that a unified identitarian intersectionality holds the promise of long-term transformational change in America. In the end, it seems, when the tug comes, everyone goes home to their own identity. Bayard Rustin struggled, perhaps more mightily than any other American radical in the 20th century, to resist the pull of identitarianism and to hold to a unified vision, race, sexuality, socialism, peace, and perhaps most of all, class. But even Rustin could not resist the pull of sectarianism, although not, as we have seen, because he wanted to, but because he had to. But even if his reach exceeded his grasp, Bayard Rustin still stands as one of the most consequential American radicals of the 20th century and a model for the 21st
because of the capaciousness of his vision, because of its programmatic nature, and ultimately because of its humanism. Bayard Rustin's radical vision took in racial minorities, but not just them. It took in sexual minorities, but not just them. It took in union members, but not just them. It took in workers, but not just them. It took in the poor, but not just them. It took in those opposed to war, but not just them. If you took them all together, if you added them up, especially the working class, they would make up a supermajority of the American people. That was Bayard Rustin's humanism. He wanted to help as many people as he possibly could, not for what divided them, but for what united them, their humanity, not their identity. Bayard Rustin ennobled American life through the moral power of his radical vision. It remains a unique vision of equality and freedom that represents the best of what America offers its citizens and the world. Bayard Rustin's legacy are that vision and his ongoing challenge to realize it in our American lives. Thank you. So that was really just a, a, a lovely narrative uh, that you guided us through. We appreciate you sharing your expertise and, and crafting that narrative. We've got some questions that are coming in uh, I'd like to bring to your attention. Maybe I'd like to start uh, just by asking you to um, to evaluate some of these awful choices. And what I mean by that is, you know, today, 2021, a lot of what you shared echoed. I saw it in the chat uh, from our audience tonight. Um, which, which of those choices do you feel uh, worked out the best? Which, where, where, where we are now, how much? Which of his his awful choices played out to um, to really benefit us? Well, you, you know, one of his most unpopular choices, uh, his choice at the 1964 Democratic Convention to try to get the Mississippi Freedom Democrats and, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to compromise on Johnson's plan to seat the white uh, uh, Mississippi delegation. On its face, that looks like a total sellout, you know. Uh, uh, and that was a very, very difficult moment for Rustin because he mm -hmm. had to go into a room with uh, uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democrats who were trying desperately to register voters in Mississippi. They were, you know, some of them were getting killed. They were getting beaten. They were getting jailed. And he had to tell them, well, this time you're going to have to let the very people who uh, are, are segregating uh, uh, Mississippi, the very people who have shut you out of power, at least this time in 1964, you're going to have to let them be seated at the convention. And the reason he did that is for the broader, greater cause, he felt, of civil rights, for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, for the Voting Rights Act of 1965, for the War on Poverty. Uh, uh, such as it was. It didn't go as far as he wanted. Uh, but these were all things that Johnson was willing to do that no other president had been willing to do. And Rustin was willing to walk into a room and be called uh, a sellout, uh, 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 probably an Uncle Tom, uh, 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 under the circumstances, for that greater goal of civil rights legislation that would truly transform America. And uh, I think that was actually a very courageous act. It was not the act of a sellout or someone who was, who, was, who was trying to gain power with the establishment. It was someone who was actually trying to change American history, uh, and he did. Uh, so I think often Rustin made you know, principled, courageous choices that were very, very difficult, uh, that probably looked bad at the time, uh, but uh, that actually worked out for America. Uh, take the freedom budget. Uh, he muted his criticism of the Vietnam War. Uh, uh, he was obviously, as you might imagine from my description of him, not happy with the Vietnam War. But he felt he had to make the argument that you don't have to cut military spending to pay for this, uh, that you, could, you can keep, uh, you keep your spending levels, including the military, as of 1966, the same, and still get 
$180 billion to eradicate poverty in America. Well, what if that had actually happened? What if he had actually been able to get that budget through? Uh, would the fact that he did not lend his one voice, his solitary voice, his single voice to the anti-Vietnam War campaign, was that too high a price to pay? It might not have been. So I think he made a lot of very difficult choices that at the time looked like bad choices that in the long run turned out you know, to, be, to be good choices. Uh, Rustin's view uh, of unions was that you could not have economic change in America without powerful unions. And so in 1968, he was willing to go to the mat with the United Federation of Teachers and take all sorts of criticism because he believed that there could not be true economic change, uh, the, a, a eradication of poverty, uh, uh, the, uh, the socialist agenda that, that he dreamed of his entire life where everyone would be economically secure without unions. And so he made that choice to oppose the black community for that reason. So I think if you look at all these choices, uh, they were very unpopular at the time, but Rustin looked to the long run. He played the long game. He was a radical who thought about the future, I think, in ways that others did not. And I think you could defend those choices from Rustin's ultimate goal, which was an equal and egalitarian society, both politically uh, and economically. Yeah, it's a great answer. Uh, let me flip that question then. In your view, what would be uh, a decision he made that, that he came up short in? What was one of his, his, his shortcomings? Uh, I, I think that his decision uh, uh, to, to go to jail in, uh, uh, during World War II uh, and basically to turn his back on that war, uh, uh, if, if there was any war that was a good war uh, and a war that needed to be fought, it was that one. Uh, I think he made a mistake, uh, and I guess I don't think I, I don't think I, I covered this in in my talk. But he had the opportunity to be a conscientious objector. He could have done that. Uh, he would have been allowed to do that and perform alternative service. But Rustin at the time was so opposed to war that he refused to even do that. He refused mm -hmm. to be a conscientious objector. He just said, "I will not fight and I will not serve in any capacity." Uh, uh, with a government that is going to war. And I think that was a mistake. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's possible that looking back uh, uh, over the years, you know, when he did that, he was in his late 20s, early 30s, uh, and perhaps much more sure of himself and much more sure of his moral positions than he may have been later on in life. I think we all uh, uh, look back on some of the decisions that we made earlier in life that we think were principled uh, as probably foolhardy and wrongheaded. And I think his decision uh, uh, to go to jail uh, uh, in, in protest of World War II specifically uh, and to reject uh, the root of conscientious objective status uh, was a mistake. Uh, thank you. Um, if any of our, anybody in our audience uh, Googles right now Rustin biography, your book published in 2008 is going to come up at the very top. Um, right. Were you able, you know, Rustin died in 1987. Were you ever, ever able to meet him? You know, that's an interesting story. Uh, in 1987, before I started graduate school, living in New York City, I lived two and a half blocks from where Rustin was living, but I didn't know it. I didn't know. I didn't know I was going to write about him. And I didn't know. I, I had heard of him, but I, you know, I didn't make that connection. And I only realized later that if I had just walked two and a half blocks and knocked on his door, he was a very outgoing, friendly man. If I had just said, I, I, I'm here. I want to talk about your life. I want to talk about democratic socialism. I'm sure that he would have just invited me in. Uh, I, I do know people who have known him. Uh, and uh, I do know his partner, Walter Nagel, uh, who was with him the last 10 years of his life. Walter Nagel uh, was much younger than, than, than Rustin. Uh, uh, I think there was probably about a 40-year difference uh, in their age. So when I was writing the biography, I, I worked pretty closely with Walter. Uh, and of course, he told me all, you know, all about him. Uh, you know, there, I'm sure we all have a list of, let's say, five people that we wish we could have met. You know, right. I wish, obviously, I could have met Abraham Lincoln. Uh, 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 
you know, uh, Russell was definitely on, on that list. I wish I could have met him. Uh, he really did contain multitudes as a personality. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, opportunities like that are wasted on the youth, right? It's it, it, all, all these oh. things that when we look back at our teenage uh, selves, our young adult selves, uh, we, we just miss these opportunities. Um, so let, let me follow up with that then and say if you know, you've mentioned a little bit of the uh, the, the people that you've interviewed, the, the oral histories you've collected. But as an historian, you work with an, a, a lot of different kinds of evidence and documents. What did you find to be the most useful as you untangled what really is a very complicated story you told tonight? What kinds of resources and documents uh, did you find most valuable, and, and where did you find them? The most important documents, I, I always say when you're trying to tell a historical story, you start at the beginning. It sounds like a truism, but you'd be surprised. You know, some people start in the middle. You start at the beginning. And what I started with uh, were the ba Bayard Rustin papers, which are in the Library of Congress on microfilm. Uh, there's, you know, a reel after reel of, of you know, of, of, of microfilm. Uh, probably at this point, uh, 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 you know, on in, in you know in another form. But I just sat down with the Bayard Rustin papers I, on real one, and I went all the way through you know the thousands of pages one by one. And I think that really you know that really was the best. Uh, oral history is great also, but you you're better off I think looking at the documentation. Just look at the documents because you know. Oral history can be tricky because, you know, people's memories sometimes are not the best. And also, frankly, uh, sometimes they try to spin you. You know, uh, I, I think I mentioned I wrote a book about the Oceanville-Brownsville controversy that obviously Rustin was involved in. And actually writing about the Oceanville-Brownsville controversy got me interested in Bayard Rustin. That was my next, you know, Rustin was my second book. Uh, doing interviews for that with uh, people who had interest in uh, a story being told in a particular way, I felt that I was being spun a lot. Uh, uh, and, you know, you, you, you really had to be careful with these, you know, with these oral histories and, and interviews. So I like to go with the documentation. Uh, fortunately for Rustin, he saved a lot. There's a lot of paper. There's a long, long paper trail. And you just start at the beginning and have patience and work your way through everything. That's such a such great advice, and we appreciate you making visible your work as an historian. You know, so often I think younger students come uh, to to history content by by telling the punchline first. You know, of course this happened this way because we know how it played out. But what you're suggesting is to really go back to the beginning and try to trace those steps um, and and construct uh, the the evidence the evidence as you can. Um, right. Here's okay. And always assume contingency. You know, when when I when I was in graduate school, I learned that very quickly. I I uh, I wrote a, a proposal for my dissertation that I showed to my advisor, my my professor, and you know he comments on it, uh, uh, you know, and writes things on it. And at the very very bottom of the prospectus, he writes, "You have too much figured out already," and <laughs> that really hit home. I had figured out my ending before I even started my research. I figured out what I thought I was going to find. You never do that. See what you're going to find. Be an empiricist uh, and start off with no assumptions whatsoever and also an appreciation for the contingencies of history. History is always contingent. There is no such thing as inevitability. Things do not have to turn out the way they did. They never have to. They never inevitably turn out. And our job as historian as historians is to explain how they did turn out, not to assume that they would turn out in a particular way. And I think that I mean that's what I try to tell my my students, my younger historians. That's a great point. I, I'm gonna conclude tonight's session with one last question and you actually kind of teed this up for me. Um, you know, one of the reasons we identified this topic for the webinar series this year was uh, was our instinct and some um, some advice from our teacher advisory council that of all of the figures, the, the important key figures of this period of time, Rustin is probably the one where that, that is the most invisible in the curriculum. That teachers have the fewest resources around, or the 
the least understanding of. You mentioned earlier Martin Luther King and the, sort of the iconic nature of his personality. And I suspect that a lot of students come to the classroom already knowing, thinking they know who Martin Luther King was. So I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about the students who come to your classes at Lawrence University. These are kids who a few years ago were likely in any of the classrooms of our audience tonight. Do they come in with any understanding of Rustin? And if not, how do they respond to him as a figure? Uh, they seem to come in with very little in, in, in the way of knowledge of them, uh, of, of, of him. Uh, sometimes they come into my class knowing that I wrote a book about someone named Bayard Rustin. So they, they do know that. Uh, uh, but they know, they know very little, not only about Bayard Rustin, but about the other great figures in the uh, civil rights movement of the 60s. They, they've never heard of Roy Wilkins, who, you know, uh, was a much more establishment figure than Rustin or King, but is very, very important. Uh, they, they really had never heard of, let's say, Whitney Young, uh, uh, the leader of the Urban League. They've heard of John Lewis. Uh, but they may not connect him to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They may just know him, you know, as a congressman. Uh, uh, they, 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 they didn't really know who, who Andrew Young was. They, they didn't know about so many of these major civil rights leaders because I, I just believe, you know, again, and, and please, you know, don't get me wrong. I don't, I'm not saying that King is not important. I'm not saying that King is the most, isn't the most important civil rights leader. He is. He is probably the most important American individual of the 20th century, but he's not the only one. And I'm afraid that Rustin especially gets squeezed out. And I think in part because Rustin was not necessarily connected specifically with an organization. You know, mm. Whitney Young, Urban League, uh, 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 you know, John Lewis has, has SNCC, uh, uh, Roy Wilkins has the NAACP, uh, you know, King obviously has Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Rustin is more of a free floater, uh, uh, and I, I think that hurts him also in terms of the, uh, you know, of, of, of historical memory and knowledge. So uh, I don't really get a lot of students who really know who he was uh, coming in, but uh, I, do, I do try to rectify that in my classes. Yeah, you know, the criticism of curriculum is often that the civil rights movement is taught in nine words. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and I have a dream. And so yeah. providing the, you know, providing the kind of context you have tonight on this figure uh, seems to be very, very important for the, the audience tonight. Uh, Professor, uh, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, please. That, that Rustin was involved in all nine of those words. <laughs> that's right. That's the, uh, that's the connecting tissue. That's a fantastic point to conclude with. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for leading the conversation tonight. Um, I hope you uh, have a good end of semester, and hopefully uh, next year will be a more stable and predictable world for us. Thank you so much, uh, Jerry. My pleasure. And I want to thank all of our audience tonight for joining us uh, for this webinar uh, series. Both the National Humanities Center and the National Council for the Social Studies welcomes your feedback and your, uh, your input on uh, the work that we've done tonight and the ways that you can use it in your classroom. You can largely do that in the Humanities of Class Digital Library. Please do follow our social media feeds for news and updates on new opportunities and activities. That includes our next webinar, which is scheduled for next week, April 22nd. We'll be joined by past NHC fellow Joni Adminson from uh, Arizona State University. Joni is a, uh, an expert scholar on environmental humanities, and we'll be discussing the language of climate change. I hope everybody uh, has a great day at school tomorrow, uh, a good productive week. We'll see you next time with the Humanities of Class webinar series. Good night, everyone.